you ever uh, had the situation with your roommate or those of us who are married with our wives or our friends where you've noticed a kind of strained relationship coming up between you and them. And it's just getting more and more strained and there isn't the openness that there was before. And you think to yourself, this is stupid. We're supposed to be helping each other. We're supposed to be close to each other. Tomorrow when I see them, I'm just going to be like I was at the beginning. We're just going to be as open as we were at the start. And so the next day comes and you just try to wump up that old love for them and it just won't come. And there's just that old resentment inside and that old irritability and you can't do a thing with it. You really want to make the thing right, but somehow there's a big lead lump of resentment and irritation deep down, and you can't get rid of it, whatever you do. Or you've discovered that some of your friends are talking about you behind your back. And you meet them, and of course you just can't feel comfortable with them. You feel that They're just lying to you, straight, face to face, you know. Because you know what they've said, and you know the way they're appearing to smile at you and be friendly with you, and you just have a tremendous sense of being the odd man out. And you find it's impossible to be open with them. And you say to yourself, this is silly. Whatever they've said to me behind my back, I have no right to have this kind of resentment against them, And you determine the next time you get into that group, you're going to forget about it. You'll joke your way out of it and you'll laugh and you'll pretend it's just like it was. And you try to do it. And it's just like lifting a big heavy weight off your shoulders. Inside there's just resentment and self-pity and a feeling that they're being unjust to you and a feeling that they're just utterly deceiving you and being traitors. In other words... In those situations, you know what you want to do. And you know what is right to do to prevent the situation deteriorating impossibly. But you cannot do it. Now, brothers and sisters, that's the kind of situation we've been talking about during the past few Sundays. Where we know fine well what we want to do. And we want to try to do it. But somehow... There's a lack of power inside us to do what we want to do and to be what we want to be. Now, the reason for that is really very obvious and it's presented in the Bible very plainly and maybe you'd look at the the passage. It's uh, Romans 7, you remember. And in it, God expresses through Paul this kind of problem that all of us have. How we want to do the right thing, but we can't do it. Now, if you read it, emphasizing what is the primary factor in this passage, you'll find out very easily what the problem is inside us that makes us feel like that. Romans 7 And verse 15. And I'll just emphasize what is in fact the uh, primary uh, uh, piece of grammar in the passage. And it'll show you where the problem lies. 15. I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. So then it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what? Thirty-five times. Really? Really? Wild. Thirty-five times the personal pronoun or the possessive pronoun, you know, in ten verses. And really that's the problem. And that's the problem with us in both of those situations that we talked about. You know what happens. We offend our friend 
or we take an action independent of them that actually causes them to resent us. That's what sets up the strain in the first place. What sets up the strain in their mind is that we did something and didn't consult with them. We maintain the strain by continuing to feel, well, I have a right to do what I wanted to do. I had a right to do that independent of them. I had a right to say what I said. In other words, what maintains that strain is the great I inside. And that great I feels it has the right to do what it's doing. It's the same if you think of the situation where they're talking about you. You know how you just sink down in self-pity. You know it. We just feel, oh, they're all against me. Well, well, they're all against me. Well, I'll be brave and courageous and I will manage all right on my own. And it's the old self-pity, you know, and the old sorrow for the way people are treating me. And of course, they, on their part, they're doing it to make themselves feel better. They talk about you because they think if they have confidence with somebody else about you, it makes them one better than you. And so they're trying to elevate themselves by turning you down. But whichever situation it is, brothers and sisters, it results from this great I inside us that wants its own way. Now that I, me, self attitude runs through all of the universe. And actually it has run through the universe for centuries. It uh, probably started in the kind of situation that you remember Isaiah described. Uh, he was talking about the king of Babylon. And uh, all the old prophets were magnificent, you know. They could talk about a situation in their time and they could then telescope history and see back into the beginning of infinity and eternity and see what had caused this present situation to crop up. And so Isaiah does that at times, you know. At times he'd be talking about the king of Babylon and his pride and his resentment and then he'll go and talk about the power that made him resent and that made him selfish like he was. And that's what Isaiah does on one occasion in Isaiah uh, chapter 14. He's talking about this king of Babylon, oh, who was going to really uh, take over the uh, land of uh, Judah uh, in about the 6th century. And uh, this hadn't taken place yet. Isaiah was talking about it going to take place in about 150 years' time. And he's describing uh, this uh, king. And then he telescopes history. Isaiah 14 and verse 12 it is. Page 597, 597. And then he looks behind the power or the force that had made the king of Babylon as selfish as he was. And he begins to talk about Satan and the origin of Satan. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. And then this was Satan's attitude, you see. Satan was at one time probably a spirit created by God to serve him. And God trusted him implicitly. But then in verse 13, he said, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the depths of the pit. And really Isaiah there is indicating that it was that kind of I, me, self attitude that caused Satan to rebel against God at the very beginning, even before creation. Now, brothers and sisters, it's that force that gets inside us and makes us cry ourselves to sleep. Really? It's that force that makes us swell with pride and envy and jealousy. It's a supernatural force that you cannot manage yourself. And you find that. We find that we can do nothing about it. And we've tried our best, but we can't do it. This I, me, self attitude wants its own way, wants to be God in every situation, wants to determine what it will do and what it will suffer. And loved ones, you can see, it just makes for chaos. I mean, there must be about maybe six or seven hundred of us here in the theatre, and we're only a fraction of the three and a half billion people in the world. But do you see the chaos that results if we all have this attitude towards each other? And you see that the only reason we have a real sense of love and harmony together this morning is that you know we all are submitting our own wishes to the wishes of Jesus and God. 
And that's why there's a sense of harmony and peace among us. Now do you see that if there are 700 of us, or three and a half billion of us, letting loose with that I-me-self attitude which insists on its own rights and wants its own way, and asserts itself and defends itself, just hell results. And that's, I think, what you and I have found. That we've tried to overcome this, but we cannot. I think that's the problem. Don't think there's one of us in the theatre who have been here the past few Sundays who cannot diagnose the problem. I think all of us would agree, yeah, I agree with you. It's I, me, self inside me that makes me want to get envious and irritable and jealous and resentful. Yeah, it's I, me, self. But what do I do about it? Do you notice that's the same problem the Eastern religions have? The Eastern religions, you know, emphasize that you have to negate the self and that you have to transcend the ego. And yet, they have impossible problems ever succeeding in doing that. They always eventually sink back into abstraction or into a preoccupation with the ego itself. And so there are many people who have diagnosed that the problem is the ego or is the self, but they cannot tell us how you get rid of it because they cannot produce a power inside that transcends the self. Now, brothers and sisters, there is a man that transcended that desire for self-glory and for self-will. There is one man who had such dynamic power of love inside himself that he destroyed this power of self. And you can see it coming out in his life, you know, again and again. Uh, uh, would you look with me at uh, John 13? It's an instance of it. John 13 and verse 21. This man would find himself in a position where one of his specially picked followers, you know, had planned in cold blood to betray him to the religious powers. And yet you find none of the resentment coming out of him that comes out of us on much, for much less reason. Verse 21 of John 13. When Jesus had thus spoken, he was troubled in spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples whom Jesus loved was lying close to the breast of Jesus. So Simon Peter beckoned to him and said, Tell us who it is of whom he speaks. So lying thus, close to the breast of Jesus, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give this morsel when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money box, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he immediately went out, and it was night. But you know, he was incredible, this man Jesus. Faced with that kind of situation, he did not rip off in anger at Judas. And he did not try to stop him. But he continued to love him and to respect his free will. Now this Jesus has that spirit inside him. Though. It's a dynamic spirit that can produce what the psychologists say we should have. You see, that's the problem. Even the dear old psychologists, they're right in the picture they paint of the integrated personality. But the killer is, how do you bring that about? How do you bring about an integrated personality? This Jesus had one inside himself. There's a, another instance, you know, if you look at Luke 22. And the religious leaders, you know, were making fun of his ministry. And they treated him just like a lunatic, really. And yet he didn't react, but remained just perfectly calm with them and was concerned only that they would hear the truth, whatever attitude they had towards him. And 63 of Luke 22. Now when the men who were holding Jesus mocked him and beat him, they also blindfolded him and asked him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they spoke many other words against him, reviling him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to the council, and they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe, and if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. 
And they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. And just incredible peace, you know. Unbelievable freedom from resentment and from all the feelings that rise up inside us. And he just went on being like that. The amazing thing is, even after he died and was raised from the dead, his spirit continued to be like that. You you could find it in Acts 9 and verses 1 through 6. And if you remember, old Paul had led a, a, a vehement persecution of the followers of Jesus and had therefore actually been trying to destroy the spirit of Jesus completely, even though Jesus had died as far as his physical body was concerned. And Acts 9 and verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And you know, not a spirit saying, you're a traitor and you're a murderer, but a voice saying, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And this voice said, Not, you're finished, and my father will have nothing to do with you, but I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And then the old concern for, the, for Paul, you know, But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Brothers and sisters, that spirit is alive today. That spirit is alive in our world. And that spirit can come into you and bring about those same reactions in you. That's how you can be delivered from self. This spirit of Jesus transcends circumstances and overcomes the old self. And it produces in you a love in place of the resentment and the self-pity. And the fact is, this spirit of Jesus does not just destroy your anger or your envy, or your jealousy, but he brings about in you a positive love, and a kindliness, and a gentleness that is supernatural. And that's the miracle of it. You see. Often, you know, I've kind of looked up to him, and said, Lord Jesus, will you love, will you love? And there's come out a supernatural love from my heart, that I couldn't produce for the other, for the other person. Because you see, we're all the same, loved ones. We all have petty little resentments towards friends. We all have little critical attitudes to those who are hurting us, who are offending us. And none of us have the power inside ourselves to respond any differently. But do you see that the spirit of this man, Jesus, is still alive? And he can respond differently inside you. And that can happen to you, you know. If you say, on what conditions? You know them. You've really to be willing to die to self with Jesus. That's it. But it's not the readiness to die to self that produces the love. Do you see that? You could be ready to die to self and be ready to be nothing for him and be a failure for him and be treated whatever way people wanted to treat you, but that would in fact itself not produce love. It's only his spirit that then is able to fill you completely that produces a supernatural love and a supernatural gentleness. And this is why, you know, some of you kind of feel at times, ah, but some people are just different from me. They don't have my hang-ups. They don't have my critical attitude. Brothers and sisters, we're all out of the same mold, you know? We're all more or less the same in the theatre this morning. We all more or less have the same kinds of problems and the same kinds of feelings of resentment and self-pity. And the truth is that Only if you receive and are filled with this new spirit can you ever transcend that. And you say how? Be willing. Be willing to die to self with Jesus. Let God destroy all the old stuff inside you and allow Jesus to take over the other. Now if you say to me, how do you know it's happened? The Holy Spirit witnesses with you when you've really come to the end of self. He witnesses. And then he fills you with this new love. And you find yourself going into situations where you know fine well people are talking about you. 
And yet there can come continual love and peace from your heart. And not a put on thing, you know, but a real thing that comes deep down from inside you. And you can come into that situation with your roommate and they've done all the wrong things. You know how hard it is, isn't it? Really hard to apologize if you weren't the one that did the thing wrong. That's the killer. We get all self-righteous and proud, you know, and we're kind of glad they made the mistake and we didn't. And we kind of say, yeah, well, it's up to them to apologize. And in the home, isn't that true in the, in the house, you know? At home or in the dorms or in your room, boy, it's so easy to feel, well, it's their turn to apologize. It's so good, you know, to have a new spirit coming out from inside you that wants to put your arms around them and apologize and make the thing right, whatever. And absorb the wounds. And really, that's what we need, you know. In our society, we don't have a lot of perfect people. We need a lot of people that will uh, will absorb a lot of punishment and respond with a lot of love. And that Jesus himself did and is able to do in you. And that's why I urge you that the only answer to the old self is really allowing that old self to die and letting Jesus' spirit take over. And he will produce a miraculous love inside you. Really? Just pray. Dear Father, you know there are countless situations in our lives where we have been unable to produce love. We've tried and we've wanted to. We've wanted to be magnanimous and big-hearted and generous, but we just hadn't got it in us. And we've sunk down in the midst of that impotence. Father, if your son Jesus, if his spirit is still alive and can bring about that love in us, then, Lord, we want that. So, Father, wherever you see our old self ruling our lives, wherever you see us wanting our own way or insisting on our own rights. Father, will you reveal that to us during today and these coming days so that we can come into real freedom from self and so that we can see how really bad we are inside and see that the only thing to do is not to patch the whole thing up or improve it, but to allow it to be destroyed with Jesus through the power of your Holy Spirit and allow his Spirit to fill us completely so that that supernatural love comes about inside us that is patient and kind, that is not jealous or boastful, that is not arrogant or rude, that does not insist on its own way, that is not easily provoked, that love that bears all things and believes all things, and that love that never ends. Father, we trust you to bring us into that, however hard we have to suffer to come in. We trust you to bring us into that victory for your glory and for our own salvation. Amen.